and welcome to Space. And this month we're here in Plymouth in southern England and in Normandy in northern France in order to see how satellites are being used in innovative new ways to understand the sea around our coastline. And we begin with a surfing scientist. Bob Bruin is pioneering a new technique in satellite oceanography by going surfing. His idea is to use this board to take sea surface temperature measurements and then use them to better interpret data from European satellite Sentinel-3. And there's a real need for those measurements. In this nearshore region of the ocean, there is a lack of uh, observations, such that it, we don't really know well the accuracy or the precision in the satellite observations. Bob's answer to that problem is a device called a smart fin. Now this smart fin is the same size and weight as a normal surfboard fin, but in it contains a temperature sensor, a GPS device, an accelerometer for measuring motion, and it has Bluetooth capabilities to transfer the temperature and motion data from the fin onto your mobile phone. So each time he surfs, the fin records the temperature. It's a new way of monitoring the coastline, a place which is important for many forms of life and is sensitive to climate change. It's a vitally important region of our seas. It contains very high levels of marine biodiversity, marine productivity. It's the spawning ground for many uh, economically important species of fish and is the foraging ground for uh, marine vertebrates such as uh, seabirds, kittiwakes and guillemots. Meanwhile, 800 kilometres above the sea surface, there's a new set of eyes in space. This month, Europe's Sentinel-3B satellite joins its sister spacecraft Sentinel-3A in orbit. They both measure sea surface temperature and ocean surface colour. And at first, they'll be flown just 30 seconds apart to verify they're working perfectly. The reason why they fly in cross formation at the beginning is because we want to cross calibrate the measurement that we obtain from the 3A, which has already been validated, with the measurement that we will obtain from its twin Sentinel 3B. Later on, we will have a constellation in orbit of two satellites that will provide the comparable data of equal quality, but much more frequently than what one satellite alone could do. Accuracy and frequency is exactly what interests these scientists from French research organisation IFREMER studying algae in the waters of Normandy. Every two weeks they measure the temperature, salinity and oxygen level of the water just off the coast and combine it with Sentinel-free data. Here we're measuring several abiotic parameters. These abiotic parameters will be used to relate with algal blooms and the growth of the algae. And it's those algae that we try to observe from the satellite, which is much larger spatial and temporal coverage. The crew are swiftly back on shore and into the lab to study what's in the seawater. You have to be aware these are biological communities, so the analysis has to be done as fast as possible. So once we've taken the samples at sea, we come straight back to the laboratory to do the analysis. Tanya works in a new project called Sentinel-3 Eurohab to study harmful algal blooms, which are poisonous for fish and even for humans. The satellite captures a broad view of the production of phytoplankton. With the in-situ measurements, we'll be able to go further and explain which species were seen by the satellite and to identify the species which are toxic. The team has already spotted an important trend. The intensity of the phytoplankton blooms has dropped significantly in the past two decades in the English Channel. 
We've studied all the data on seawater color coming from NASA and ESA over the past 20 years in order to follow the evolution of the quantity of phytoplankton from day to day around the coastal waters of the English Channel and the Bay of Biscay. And what we've seen is a relative reduction in the quantity of phytoplankton, especially in the summertime. Back at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, and Bob Bruin is checking the calibration of his smart fin, a technology he'd like to see used across Europe to monitor the seas and track the trends of climate change. The dream is to have surfers, and not only surfers, actually other water sports enthusiasts, canoeists, stand-up paddleboards, divers, who also regularly go in and out, in, in and out the ocean for fun. Equipped with the, these types of technology, um, they can measure things like important components like temperature, which we can use synergistically to really improve our satellite data sets. The potential to realise that dream is there. In the UK, it's estimated that 40 million coastal sea surface temperature measurements could be taken by surfers every year. Well, now we're inside in the warm here at Plymouth Marine Labs and we can get to the part of the show in which we take your questions about the universe and put them to the experts using the hashtag AskSpace. And I'm joined by a video link from California by Seth Shostek, who's a senior astronomer at the SETI Institute. Seth, we've had a lot of questions about aliens. Petro Brits would like to know, will we ever find any real evidence of extraterrestrials out there? I, I think that we most definitely will. And uh, the reason is, A, I think that it is out there. I mean, you know, there are a million, million planets just in our galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy. That's an awful lot of real estate. So it's hard to believe that only this planet has life. So the only real question, B, is can we find it? We're looking for intelligent life. I've bet everybody a cup of coffee that will find uh, life by 2025, intelligent life. OK, well, that leads me into another question we had from Dan Alex. He'd like to know, is there a particular direction we should be looking in to look for aliens? I spend many uh, nights tossing and turning in my bed thinking about this problem. Where should we aim the antennas, after all? Where are the aliens hanging out? One obvious place is the center of the Milky Way, because in the center of the galaxy, there's a, an enormous source of energy. There's a giant black hole there. You know, there are a lot of stars. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff. There's a lot of energy. That seems like one place you should aim the antennas, and we occasionally do. Well, Seth, thanks very much for joining us. Excellent to have your answers there. Remember, you can send your questions to us using the Ask Space hashtag, and we'll try to answer them. And you can see other episodes in the series on Euronews.com. <laughs>